So I'd like to introduce Simon Wilson, <coughs> who's going to talk to us about the numinous and sublime in relation to Burke, and his talk is Burke's Aesthetics of the Spirit. So um, let me present Simon Wilson. Yep, thank, thank you. Very you. Much. Martin, I don't think our two talks will supplement each other very nicely, so that's excellent. It's clearly meant to be. Um, if we are to address the question of inspiration by the numinous other, we have to take seriously the spiritual realm. That is, we have to accept the reality of a plane, of, uh, a plane unconditioned by material, emotional, psychic, social or or other factors. If we deny this, uh, the existence of this plane, it may disappear from our view altogether. The consequences of such a denial could only be an impasse, which served to restrict research and block insight. One could equally and more accurately say that it would lead to the construction of a wall of rationality around our realist selves, and thus prevents truly transformative forces from breaking in, thus selling us heinously short as human beings. If then we are to understand, in the words of this conference's call for papers, and I quote, how the numinous other is conveyed and depicted, how its voice is heard, how it informs and has always informed human experience, end quote, we need an approach which takes into account our true and essential nature as humans. This nature is primarily spiritual and secondarily physical and psychic. A tripartite model, spiritual, physical, psychic, a tripartite model which can be traced back at least to St. Paul, who in his first epistle to the Thessalonians in the, uh, to St. Paul in his first epistle to the Thessalonians refers to our spirit and soul and body. In this understanding, body refers to the facts of our physical existence, while soul is, in the words of one writer, the nexus of thoughts, emotions and desires that occupy most of our inner lives. It describes our, our natural, our everyday consciousness and emotions, the spirit, finally, is our immortal, unconditioned and divine part, our essential reality. It is from God and exists always in God. Body, soul and spirit form a complex unity, then, in which the body is the vehicle for the soul and the soul vehicle for the spirit. Most of us, however, live as if the spirit did not exist and mistake our world of emotions, thoughts and desires for reality then the body and soul effectively occlude the spirit. We drown in the material or are suffocated by the psychic. However, when the spirit has given its due place in the triad, its glow envelops the body and soul as a bulb is completely surrounded by the light it radiates. When that happens, the spirit is revealed to be the true vehicle of soma and psyche, and importantly, to be unconfined by them. We need an approach then which takes into consideration not only the elements of our being, but also their proper relation to one another. Daemons may play an important role here. They are intermediaries or messengers between the spirit in and around us and the rest of our being, our everyday somatically and psychically conditioned selves. In the familiar passage from Plato, we read, Everything that is demonic is intermediate between God and mortal, interpreting and conveying the wishes of men to gods and the will of gods to men. It stands between the two and fills the gap. Like the angels on the ladder witnessed by Jacob, demons descend and ascend, reconciling on the one hand the material and psychic, the world if you like, with, on the other, the eternal divine. And daemons thus give form to the divine source, are aspects, that is, of God. Such personifications are necessary for us, living in the world of material and mental form as we do. We respond to them 
because they are individuated, while at the same time they partake much more intimately than we do of divine truth. Their very existence, however, also serves to underline how distant we are from the divine. If we were closer, we would not need them. And therein lies a danger if we pay too much attention to daemons as such. Their undoubted fascination and charisma may blind us to the fact that, if I may be permitted to use such terms, they are only bearers of the message and not the message itself. To mistake them for the real itself could indeed entail a kind of idolatry, separating us from our true spiritual self instead of linking us to it. That this is a hazard inherent in a daemon is demonstrated by the very etymology of the term itself. As Jean Gibson has written, the root of the word daemon, and I quote, is revealing. It is da, and has in Sanskrit as dayata, the sense he divides, cuts off. And the related Greek verb deomai, Gibsa goes on, means not only divide, but cut into pieces. Take to bits, tear to pieces, tear limb from limb. It's much better in the original German, I think. <laughs> sehr teilen, sehr legen, sehr reißen, sehr fleischen. Take to bits, take, take apart, tear limb from limb. Daemons can only reveal to us the promptings of the spirit if we can, as it were, see through them. Otherwise, they can only serve to cut us off from our true birthright. I do not, of course, wish to be understood as arguing against interest in the demonic. I merely intend to just alter the focus a little. There is another approach which I believe avoids the demonic pitfalls. It addresses our full nature as human beings and accounts for inspiration as well as the effects of inspired art. It does so by, as it were, cutting out the demonic middlemen and describing the sudden flooding of being by the divine. It is to be found in the field of aesthetics and is called the sublime. Now, I have to say that this is by no means a straightforward claim to make and seems at first sight to be considerably more problematic than the discourse on daemons. For example, Ananda K. Kumaraswamy has argued that, and I quote, our use of the term aesthetic forbids us to speak of art as pertaining to the higher things of life, or the immortal part of us. If daemon is a Greek word, so is aesthetics. And Kumaraswamy reminds us that the Greek original of the word aesthetic means perception by the senses, and that the term implies that art is evoked by and has for its ends to express and again evoke emotions. Aesthetics, in Kumaswami's view, is concerned solely with, the, with fleeting sensations and passions or with the shifting surface of appearances. It would seem in this view to trap us more securely than any daemon in the somatic and psychic. We can, however, rescue at least one category of aesthetics from this crushing rejection. For in the theory of the sublime, we find an account of human nature which returns us to the traditional complex unity of body, soul, and spirit. One could indeed say that it describes the embodiment and the ensoulment of the spirit, or more accurately, the enspiritment of the body and soul. The sublime was central to aesthetic discourse in the 18th century. Its influence can be traced back to the rediscovery of a first or second century treatise on the sublime, attributed to Longinus. One critic has summarised the qualities generally associated with the sublime like so. Wildness, grandeur and overwhelming power, which in a flash of intensity could ravish the soul with a sudden transport of thought or feeling. It was discussed in many 18th century works. But the single most important influential account in the English language is certainly Edmund Burke's A Philosophical Inquiry into the Origin of Our Ideas of the Sublime and the Beautiful, which was published in 1757 and then reissued in a revised edition in 1759. 
And in his philosophical inquiry, we find the following description of the term. Whatever operates in a matter analogous to terror is a source of the sublime. Indeed, Burke writes, terror is in all cases whatsoever, either more openly or latently, the ruling principle of the sublime. We are still on the level of body and soul here, the merely natural level to which Kumaraswamy condemns all of aesthetics. And indeed, Burke's aesthetics are traditionally understood to belong firmly in this sphere. Uh, Vanessa L. Ryan has written, for example, that Burke presents an empirical view of aesthetic taste based on sensation and on our physiological responses to sensation. Physical and psychic effects of the sublime are, however, for Burke, merely the necessary beginning of a cathartic process which can result in a kind of resurrection of the body, here and now, in which it and the soul are transformed by spirit. To understand how that may work, we have to follow Burke through the stages of the process. He describes how the sublime revivifies us, both physically and psychically. I quote, As a due exercise is essential to the coarse muscular parts of the constitution, and that without this rousing they become languid and diseased. The very same rule holds with regard to those finer parts we have mentioned, that is, the finer and more delicate organs on which and by which the imagination and perhaps the other mental powers act. To have them in proper order, they must be shaken and worked to a proper degree. The sublime works through our constitution to bring about a radical reordering, a rearranging of both body and soul, shaking and breaking them up to subsequently re-establish healthy order. Physical and psychic blockages are removed so that life can flow again. I quote Burke again, if the pain is not carried to violence and the terror is not conversant about the present destruction of the person, these emotions clear the parts, whether fine or gross, of a dangerous and troublesome encumbrance, they are capable of producing delight. Not pleasure, but a sort of delightful horror, a sort of tranquility tinged with terror. The sublime describes, in fact, how we feel when the body and the soul are revitalized and their disorder, disarray and confusion are healed. It is a kind of salutary terror which produces a feeling perhaps best described as calm, yet delighted awe. Burke, however, moves beyond this stage, beyond the natural man, to address the spiritual effects of the sublime. And he does this by turning to the presence of the divine in the psyche of the individual experiencing the sublime. God, in fact, is central to the sublime, though Burke is wary of mentioning him in the context which may be understood as trivialising the divine. He writes, I purposely avoided when I first considered the subject to introduce the idea of that great and tremendous being, God, a great and tremendous being, as an example in an argument so light as this, though it frequently occurred to me not as an objection to it, but as a strong confirmation of my notions on this matter. Indeed, he finds that the sublime is the foremost and, in fact, most characteristic aspect of God when we encounter him directly as full human beings, unfiltered by the abstract reasoning. I quote, Some reflection, some comparing is necessary to satisfy us of his wisdom, his justice and his goodness. To be struck with his power, it is only necessary we should open our eyes. But whilst we contemplate some vast and object under the arm, as it were, of almighty power, and invested upon every side with omnipresence, we shrink into the minuteness of our own nature and are, in a manner, annihilated before him. Burke's words seem, at first sight, to be rather unsettling. Encountering God and his manifestations, we're blanked out. We contract to a mere point, crushed as it were, we seem to lose all freedom and become a little oppressed scrap 
a fearful remnant. Burke, however, is referring to the annihilation of our merely natural self, of a self produced by a body and soul which are themselves largely determined by matter and the world. That self is erased, only to be replaced by our highest self, the spiritual self. This becomes clear when Burke, writing of the sublime experience at its most elevated, indicates that the mind is so entirely filled with, the, with its object that it cannot entertain any other. The imagination is in this case so filled by the divine, unfiltered by reasoning or abstraction, that nothing else is present to it. The idea of God, that is, when utterly experienced in its full and present in the soul of an individual is completely different in quality and essence from all ideas which result from sense impressions or abstract reasoning. It frees us from ideas passively uh, determined through our senses and from conditioning of any kind. The divine then permeates us, body and soul, and we recall our true nature. What is important here is that it is fully experienced. To fully experience something is to fully live it, not merely to entertain an idea for pleasure. It then radiates through one's being, one holds being. The idea of God then ceases to be an idea and becomes an enfleshed reality within and without us. The sublime, in other words, the sublime, in other words, is what it feels like to incarnate the divine. The ordinary sublime then produces two things, physical and psychic revitalization. But in the sublime encounter with God, the divine sublime, three things happen simultaneously. The fleshly fibers of the body are subjected to health-giving exercise, strengthening and enlivening the frame. The soul is revitalized, reordered and healed. But if we are capable of fully experiencing the sublime which has its origin in God, then our imagination is filled with him. Our divine spiritual self floods us, body and soul, liberating us from the material and mechanical. We can understand this event as a kind of resurrection of the body, here and now. The natural body drops away, but the spiritual body takes its place. Sublime catharsis is a transformation of the self through the body and soul so that they are placed under the dominion of the spirit right now in this life. We become fully enfleshed and ensouled spirits. Burke's sublime describes the effect works of art may have on us and the effects of other things, such as buildings, landscapes, or to select a few words at random from Burke's contents table, the effects of obscurity, power, vastness, infinity, or magnificence. All of these occasions of the sublime are essentially manifestations or symbols of the divine presence. In the sublime moment, the world and its phenomena become a revelation of God. The real shimmers through the relative. As St. Paul writes, the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. Or the opening lines of Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. The cosmos itself, that is, becomes demonic, proclaiming in all of its diversity the one, it is these moments which inspire, which fill the creative artist. And he or she then becomes a living incarnation of the divine presence, a local manifestation of the spirit, a bearer <coughs> of a superhuman message. He or she becomes a daemon. This, of course, is an evanescent state and not a permanent condition. Artists, for example, are are generally not saints, and few indeed are embodiments of divine reality. Their somatic and psychic parts continue to predominate, and as personalities they may be unremarkable. 
but the wind bloweth where it listeth, and the sublime can strike at any moment like thunder, leaving one temporarily at least demonic. Perhaps artists are people who can hear more acutely than others the blowing of the wind, and any such theurgic moment cannot help but leave a faint residue of colouring behind in the individual with inevitable salutary just as the sublime may be occasioned, for example, by a landscape, the works of the sublime artist may not, on the surface at least, be about God. They do not comprise a description of God or of divine works. To expect that would be to mistake the surface of form for the spirit. It would be pure idolatry. Sublime works are icons, not idols, behind which the divine presence exerts a kind of presence an underlying intimation. There can be infinite variations in ostensible subject matter or style. Burke admittedly concentrates on the high poetry of a Virgil or a Milton. But the sublime can equally be present in satire, in irony or in farce. A sublime work, in fact, is unlikely to comply with the classical rules of form as defined by human reason. Poem or play, for instance, may express as fully as possible divine reality, but it will also display certain ambiguities or contradictions, as the infinite cannot be squeezed perfectly into the finite receptacle of human language. But if a work effectively transfers the spark of sublime inspiration to the reader or onlooker, then he or she too will bear that spark if they are open to it they too can become demonic. It is significant that the discourse on the sublime came so much to the fore in the 18th century. It constituted a kind of saving grace in the age of reason. Banished from science and philosophy, increasingly absent from theology and the church, the spirit re-emerged, first in aesthetics and then, perhaps with a short delay, in art itself. The work of Blake or Wordsworth is testimony to the new responsibility felt by artists as potential bearers of light and truth in a benighted and deluded age. It is doubtful whether most contemporary artists would share this view of their responsibility. Much the same could be said of critics and scholars which only goes to show how blind and deaf they are to the realm beyond the beguiling enticements of meta, emotions and sensations. Burke, in fact, in addition to the sublime, also describes a view of art which is purely material, which exists wholly without reference to divine reality. He calls it the beautiful, and it consists of the indulgence of pleasing feelings. It lulls us into a sweet sleep, the sleep of matter and of the soul. Burke argues, quote, beauty acts by relaxing the solids of the whole system. There are all the appearances of such a relaxation, and a relaxation somewhat below the natural tone seems to me to be the cause of all positive pleasure. Who is a stranger to that manner of expression so common in all times and in all countries of being softened, relaxed, enervated, dissolved, melted away by pleasure? What he calls the beautiful consists of a descent into pure sentiment and pure sensationalism. It occludes the spirit under soft and heavy layers of physical and emotional flab. It makes us greedy for more emotional food. It lures us into addiction to physical and psychic gratification. We need and become lost in an endless flood of images without centre. This predicament is both a cause and a symptom of the failure of the artists, of artists and their audience to acknowledge the reality of the divine. Such metaphors illuminate the danger of drowning in the quotidian, 
perceiving nothing beyond the sublunary. They may admittedly be somewhat exaggerated, but it seems to me that unless scholars are open to the reality of the divine, open to the spirit, they will fail to understand manifestations of the numerous. We have to be prepared to slough off our everyday selves and to be transformed by the presence of the, of the divine. We too have to become daemons, however briefly and however lowly. <laughs>